Welcome to Expat Hoops. Today we talk with the University of Miami's DJ Vasilevich, who plays in his native Australia for the Sydney Kings. Before we talk to DJ, I want to remind you to be interactive with us at Expat Hoops. We're active on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can also show your support for content like this by hitting the like button, subscribing to the channel, or commenting below the video on our YouTube page. We also have a Patreon page where we put content you won't find elsewhere. You get additional content and it helps support this pod. It is a win-win. Now, if you'll join Tony and I in welcoming DJ to Expat Hoops, welcome to the show, DJ. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Uh, now, you actually have kind of an interesting background. Uh, born to um, Serbian parents, born in Canada, have basically lived in Australian uh, in Australia since you're six years old. Uh, take us through what that's like kind of having that background now as you're a professional overseas. Um, I mean, it's just, just where I'm from, I guess. It's close to hard, all three kind of countries. And, you know, I take great pride in representing all three at the same time. So, um, yeah, no, it's been cool. Like, I've got dual citizenships and stuff like that. So it kind of makes traveling a little bit easier, um, you know, entering countries and so forth like that. But yeah, it's just um, just representing them with pride. Uh, one of the interesting things I, I saw in your background was that uh, essentially that you didn't start really playing. I think it was probably organized basketball until you're like 12. Um, and in your bio, I think for Miami, it said that you kind of molded your game after Drazen Petrovic. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that's um you know, I started playing when I was like 11, turning 12. Um, probably didn't start playing organized ball until maybe a year after that. It was more just fun and games. Um, but yeah, Drazen Petrovic was a guy I looked up to. Uh, my dad would show me a lot of footage of him, kind of what he did at a very young age. And, you know, he was just dominating and obviously playing the NBA for a little bit. And, you know, tragically, he died in a car accident. So, you know, you see the greats like Reggie Miller and Peja Stojakovic talk about him. Um, so... He's definitely up there as, you know, one of the best shooters. Obviously, Steph Curry, number one, but, you know, he's definitely up there as well. But, yeah, that's just someone who I model my game around. Yeah, that was one of the interesting things that in, in doing uh, the background for you is is that, you know, you're you're pretty young. I mean, you you basically were born, I think it was roughly four years after he, you know, untimely passed. Um, and, you know, obviously there's a number of years that, you know, you didn't take up basketball, like you said, seriously. Like it was fun in games, but you didn't take it up seriously. And so, like, when you're molding your game after somebody – that, you know, hadn't hadn't played a game for, you know, a decade and a half at that point in time. It's kind of an interesting, interesting person to choose. And, and certainly somebody that anybody that's a fan of basketball from that period of time knows, I mean, unbelievable player. And unfortunately, like you said, uh, passed way too soon. Uh, so I just thought that was kind of an interesting, uh, essentially model for your game. Yeah, uh, no doubt. I mean, you know, if you watch the documentary Once Brothers, you know, it talks about kind of the Yugoslavian team and how good they were able to compete. And, and obviously, you know, things went south and the war, you know, kind of broke out and stuff. But again, like, you know, I'm not very educated in that part. You know, there's a lot of history behind it. But, you know, I just try to stay positive and just model my game around him. So you chose to attend uh, Miami over offers from some other pretty big schools, LSU, Louisville and Stanford. What was ultimately the decision where you ended up going to Miami? Uh, I think it was just more like what Coach L and his system were about. Um, just, you know, they were a guard-heavy program, you know, developed a lot of guards, like Shane Larkin, you know, Bruce Brown, who's, you know, a very close friend of mine, Lonnie Walker, another great close friend of mine, like Davon Reed. Like, there's been so many greats come through the program and, and have had successful careers and still playing. So I think that was kind of the main driver. Um, both my parents are highly educated, so kind of the school was another option for me. You know, I got my bachelor's degree and my master's degree from there. So, um, you know, that was another you know big part for it as well. And, of course, coming from us being two Mason grads, uh, we can understand uh, choosing Coach L and the school that he coaches over some others as we were there when he went to the Final Four at Mason as well. Um, following your junior season, you considered actually turning professional then, but he actually convinced you – uh, to return. Um, that's a, a pretty unique decision uh, in terms of uh, looking to try to turn pro after your junior year, maybe leave school a little bit early. What uh, drove you to pursue that and what ultimately drove you to come back? Um, I think it was because I just graduated in May of that year. I think it was 2019 when I just finished junior year and you know, a lot of people were asking the question, oh, did you want to play professionally? There was a lot of agents hit me up, a lot of professional teams in Europe and in Australia were kind of, you know, asking, you know, what I would be doing. And, 
you know, eventually I ended up going back, you know, you only experienced college once. So I did really want to experience that whole senior year type of vibe where pretty much take none, no classes once you graduate and um, you get to kind of, you know, you know, break a few milestones or try and break a few records. You enjoy, you know, senior day. You know, I had two of my best friends there, I had my sister there. Um, so it was just, you know, it was just great. So with that experience where you're kind of sort of put your toe in the water of whether or not you wanted to play overseas or not, um, and then ultimately when you graduated, well, when you were actually after your senior year, as we talked off the pod, you graduated early, uh, wound up getting your master's and everything while you were a senior uh in terms of athletically, what was the process like for you in terms of finding an agent? Um, I'm sure that you probably thought at some point that you were going to be playing overseas, whether it was back at home in Australia or somewhere overseas. So what was your process like in terms of navigating that? Um, it was just kind of just making a list of you know agents and keeping the list very short, you know, meeting them a few times here and there and kind of just checking what their vibe was like. You know, a lot of people can, you know, tell you this, 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 but if they don't kind of you know put their actions or put their actions into words like what they've done like then there's no point and obviously i chose a great agency and very high sports agency you know two of my agents do a great job with me found me a great contract here in sydney to start my pro career and you know there is a lot of interest um you know in europe and the nba obviously i am returning from an achilles injury so it's just more about kind of proving that i'm back healthy and and i feel like i'm, I'm a better player i'm a better you know scorer shooter just like just having a minor setback like that, you know, I had one in college where I broke my foot, you know, changed my diet completely, boom, I haven't, you know, my junior year was my best year, um, you know, statistically wise. So again, you know, I had a great season last year in the NBL, you know, it was cut short, unfortunately, but I think this is just, you know, another story to tell. And I think I'll come back better than I was. And one of the things that uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier on was after your junior year, you were thinking about going pro and, at that point in time, it was more a little bit international, but after your senior year, uh, when you actually decided to go out and be a professional, take us through what the thought process was and what the offers were that you had at the time and why you decided to sign where you signed. Yeah, I mean, obviously COVID didn't help. Um, it was about nine, nine to 12 teams, NBA teams interested in bringing me in for a workout, kind of just to showcase um, you know, what I could do a little more. Uh, I felt like my last two seasons at Miami, I was held a little back, just being able to do, you know, my own thing. Like if you do compare my time in Miami or to like a time where I go play for my national team, um, especially in Italy, in, you know, in the summertime, like I was one of the top scorers, you know, we did, we, we fell short, we won a bronze medal, but, you know, I was you know, pretty much voted MVP of that tournament. So I was able to do my own thing. So, you know, I felt like, you know, Coach L did hold me back a little bit, but again, that's not on him. I'm not going to blame him for it. You know, things happen. Uh, you move on. But yeah, you know, nine or 12 teams were interested. You know, you couldn't do it because of COVID. And then um, my agent found a very, very good deal with the Sydney Kings. And uh, yeah, I'm, I am happy where I am now. So yeah, you signed a three year deal out of college. Is that uh, something that's relatively commonplace in the NBL or is that something that's um, pretty unique? Yeah, there's. There's more to it in my contract. It's not just a three year. You got to stay here for three years. There's always like an out option after the first, second, and stuff like this. There's different components to it, and I won't go into detail because it's confidentiality between me, my agent, and the team. But you know, they usually do try sign you for a long period of time, and unless you're like an NBA type player off the jump, um, you know, they will sign you for a year, and then you'll probably leave after that. And lucky for me, I was a three year deal, and then however long it takes for me to get, you know, to Euroleague or NBA, like. They're happy with it. Looking further ahead, do you anticipate uh, playing much longer in Australia? I know you mentioned just a, a couple of seconds ago that you were looking, you know, potentially for EuroLeague. I know you're happy where you're at, but uh, I assume this early in your career, you haven't really shut any doors or anything like that. No, no chance. Like I, I want to kind of experience the overseas life in Europe, you know, playing at a high level EuroLeague team or even, you know, being able to be on an NBA team for a couple of years if I can. And, I think I do have the potential, you know, I've seen a, a few people make the NBA that, you know, probably I wouldn't say don't deserve it, but, you know, have kind of worked their way in somehow with a lot of questions being asked. So I'm not going to sit here and you know, crap on people and stuff like that because that's not me. But again, yeah, I, I really do want to go play, you know, in Europe or the NBA. And, you know, this may or may not be my last season in Sydney. One of the interesting things I think you said earlier on in our interview actually was even talking about this injury is that you feel like you're even an even better player 
or you're becoming an even better player now. Actually, I was kind of hoping you could elaborate on that. Obviously, I know that, you know, being away from the game, you know, you might be able to, you know, have things slow down for you a little bit mentally or whatever in terms of being able to process it. But what exactly about it with this injury that kind of makes you feel like, you know what, I'm coming back better than ever? Um, I think it's just like when you get hurt, you sit there and watch your team kind of miss the playoffs and, and struggle a little bit. You're like, damn, like, you know, if I was out there, you know, I'm not saying I'm the main guy, but, you know, definitely would have made a difference. And you just start to think like, hey, never take, you know, things for granted in life. And, you know, some people, when they tear their Achilles, they don't come back from it or they, they tear an ACL, they don't come back from it. So, you know, I had a great surgeon. I was, you know, I did mine on a Thursday night. I was in this, you know, surgeon's um, table right the next morning. He got me done real quick. Um, and then, you know, I was just rehabbing from there. Lucky Sydney allowed me to take two months off and go to the States and kind of rehab in Miami there, kind of see good kind of old friends and family and stuff like that. So that kind of helped me mentally. You know, I returned and now, you know, nearly back to full go with the team with hoping to play that late December or early January. So. Another thing you mentioned was your international career. And I, I know that like in terms of trying to picture the timeline, you mentioned the 2019 tournament where you played really, really well that, you know, as a team, you won the bronze and everything like that. And that also kind of is about the same time that you were thinking about going pro before you ultimately went pro. Can you kind of contrast a little bit what it's like playing in inter- what it's been like so far playing for you internationally with the Australian team, whether it's, you know, the under 17s or, or, you know, wherever you've played along the way, with how you've played either in college or professionally, like what's what's sort of the stylistic difference that you kind of get to showcase yourself a little bit better that way? Yeah, I think the college system is more you play against athletes, you know, much quicker guys. It's not much structured basketball unless, you know, you're a great team like Villanova or, or Michigan State or stuff like that, or even a Duke, like they're good. But, so, you know, some teams you play is just run and gun and if you try to outrun the team, that's how you win. Or if you try to outshoot the team, that's how you win. Like when you play internationally, it's all strategic stuff. Like you watch, you know, our Olympic team, you know, win a bronze medal against like the likes of Luca. You know, we did, you know, we put US to the test in the semi final, but they got over the line. Obviously, Kevin Durant, the best player in the world, like can't do anything about that. But yeah, it's just a whole different ball game internationally. Um, you know, I've had a great experience, uh, won a silver medal at the 17s and won a bronze medal at the university game. So it's just it's just good times when you play for your country and represent it with pride. Hmm. I imagine it's nice too playing on uh, uh, somewhat home turf for you uh, professionally on your first stint um, overseas. I guess if uh, you were to pick a place to play outside of the NBA, it's not a bad uh, gig to start with. Yeah, I know, that's for sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of good to be back home. I mean, I'm not home in Sydney. Sydney's not home. Melbourne's home for me, mm-hmm. but... Again, you know, I'm closer to home than I was before and, you know, good to be back after five years. So, you know, being able to chill with friends and family when I can and they're actually close by so they can come visit. So it's, it's very good. Well, and to that end also with COVID, uh, everybody that we have on the podcast basically since we started, because this was a COVID creation, has their own COVID story. And it actually probably is somewhat fortunate that you weren't away in some faraway land that, you know, they shut down the league and everything. Uh, that you're actually, like you said, it's Sydney may not necessarily be home, but your home country. So what was your COVID experience like, given that this was sort of the timeline too? Um, you know, Australia did, you know, at the start did a very good job kind of containing COVID and shutting borders and stuff like that. And, you know, we did have to relocate when there was an outbreak in Sydney, just so we could be able to travel through state through uh, state to state, because each state had their own kind of border control. So, you know, we relocated for about two or three months. Um, and then when we got home and played in front of our fans in Sydney, it was just wild. Like we had seven or 8,000 come to the game. Uh, it was just, ex- it's just a great experience for me. So yeah, it's not too bad. Like COVID's, I think coming to a normal here in Australia with the vaccine rate, you know, just over 80% total as a country in general. So oh. you know, we've done a really good job on that end. So, you know, people say the vaccine does work, doesn't work. Like for me, being an athlete and kind of, being around people a lot I do take it just to protect me protect my family and stuff like that so I mean yeah I think Australia's done a good job now that we've got you know the vaccine rate really high you have a higher uh, vaccination rate than the United States and you got the vaccine a little later than we did so I, I would definitely say you have yeah no nah, because I went to the states July 4th and I wasn't vaccinated so I was getting the vaccine the next day and it was just crazy to see people just like it was nothing like COVID didn't exist there in Miami so it was just a whole different ballgame compared to what it is here. 
well, we'll just let that speak for itself and move on. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to ask you about uh, what the crowds are like in the NBL. Obviously, some of it with uh, COVID was a little bit of a wrinkle for, you know, uh, you know, some of the restrictions probably that you guys were under in terms of crowd size and everything. But uh, if you could kind of compare, you know, if you're telling the average American that's, you know, used to college basketball games, you know, whether it's a Miami or an ACC country, whatever you want to say, what would be the differences, if any, that you see between the Australian crowds and the NBL versus American crowds? Um, obviously, I think Americans are very passionate for their sport, no matter what the sport is. Obviously, NFL, baseball, NBA, like you always see like a full stadium. And I think for us here in Australia, you know, we have AFL, which is Australian football. Um, that's kind of the main one for us where we pack it pretty, pretty big. But here in Sydney, man, like our stadium holds 18,000. And yeah, because of COVID, you know, restrictions, the, big, the biggest we got was 11,000. But uh, this year now, we're going back to full crowds and stuff. We've kind of broken memberships. Um, there's a lot of people that are interested. So I think we'll, we might sell out a few games. And 18,000 people is a lot of people. So um, I look forward to that. Are there any sort of perks that you get being in the NBL? Uh, Sydney Kings are obviously a, um, a large city uh, that you you have access to quite a bit. Uh, are there any perks of, you know, without going into anything confidential with your contract or anything like that that you get in being in the NBL? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it just depends uh, on the player and how good you are, really, um, to be included in those perks. So I'm lucky to be kind of fall in that category so Sydney does treat me really well um definitely that but yeah we get perks of going to other sports um other sporting events different you know rooftop events like it's pretty sick like we call ourselves the hoops capital and we kind of just try to connect all the different sports and you know the theater and all that stuff like obviously the opera house and we kind of do all try to just combine it all together so that's kind of sick hmm. oh wow that's really interesting yeah, anything you can do with the Opera House is a good thing. Obviously, the, yeah. the iconic landmark there is a good way to go. Yeah, for sure. Um, can you tell us about any unique experiences you might have had in your international career while you were uh, representing Australia in other tournaments? Is there anything in particular that was stood out to you uh, as far as the differences between uh, the way you played in college and the way you've now played professionally? Yeah, I think. Um, it all comes down like the coaching and a lot of coaches on the national teams have let me rock and let me do my own thing. And that's, I think that's why I play best. Like where I don't have to think about you know, the shot I take or the play I have to run. Like he goes, all right, here's the ball, DJ, do something with it. You know, like that's why I think, you know, I'm, I'm not going to just take full advantage of that and kind of just do my own thing. Like I know when to kind of do my own thing, but also when to get the team involved. So I'm kind of really good, good at that. So yeah, it's just, you know, the coaches you have, you know, just letting you play. And I think when the coaches let me play, we've been really success successful, obviously, with a silver medal and a bronze medal. So shout out to them. For sure.